Sunday morning, go to your local church. Sunday night, a lot of churches don't have services. John or not's going to be here. If you're going to be here Sunday night, get here early, okay? We'll put up extra chairs, but you won't get in unless you're here early. Most likely you'll get stuck out there somewhere. So be here really, really early on Sunday night, on Monday and Tuesday. Monday during the day, Tuesday during the day, Gil and Lorraine are going to be preaching. And the attendance has been excellent. If you've been in their ministry, you will not be disappointed. It's God. It isn't Gail, it isn't Lorraine, but they got a message in their heart from the Lord. Amen? So let's put our hands together and welcome Gail back to the pulpit tonight. Yay! We love him. Amen. Well, glory. Woo! Green Regency, your headlights are on. You want to get home tonight, make your way out to the Green Regency. It sounds like a hotel. <laughs> and somebody left a, that may be an offering for me, brother. No, I'm sorry. Somebody left a set of car keys outside. So if you're missing a car or you're missing keys to the car, then you'll have to go as a lost and found. Amen. Anything that's not recovered by the end of this week is donated to our ministry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, is God good or what? Oh, thank you, all three of you. I said, is God good or what? Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, this is, you know, a good time to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There are many people out in the world tonight that are partying and getting drunk in the natural and uh, spending a lot, lot more than probably most gave in the offering tonight in order to try and get happy. And then tomorrow they'll get up with a hangover and go make friends at the toilet. And then they'll go and tell their neighbors what a wonderful party we had. But the Christians will leave the presence of God not with a hangover, they wake up the next day with an overhang. An overhang is the afterglow of the glory of God. Amen. And so you have something that you can take to your neighbors or whatever tomorrow morning and to your in-laws and your outlaws and just carry the blessing of God with you. Hallelujah. And uh, the wave of the Spirit is so wonderful. I tell you what, it's building and getting stronger and more and more churches are being affected and infected. Some of them would hope to have an antibiotic, <laughs> some kind of vaccination against revival. But it's, it's spreading farther, faster than you can even imagine. <laughs> Hallelujah. About eight years ago when I received the touch of God back in, in uh, it, it happened to be on the West Coast too, funny enough, in Agoura Hills in California. Uh, in 1989, when uh, my brother Rodney Howard Brown was in upstate New York, and he was preaching one night, he had a Holy Ghost con camp meeting or convention, week of meetings. Actually, it was a Sunday night through a Wednesday night, funny enough. Those were revival in those days, it was Sunday through a Wednesday night, you know. And all of a sudden, an elderly gentleman, around about, must have been in his late 70s, just suddenly began to laugh uncontrollably. And it jumped across onto his wife, and the two of them began to laugh. God actually healed their marriage right that very same night. And uh, it jumped, to, spread down the row and jumped across the aisle, and pretty soon the whole building was in an uproar, and people were getting drunk in the Holy Ghost, and... My brother just figured this is a great meeting, you know, wonderful. Well, the next night, the same thing happened. And after three or four meetings, he eventually said, well, you know, this is ruining my meetings. And he said, he, he was sure the Lord said to him, well, son, the way your meetings are going, they were worth ruining. <laughs> and it uh, kind of figured, well, this was peculiar for this particular church. But then it came and... Every other meeting it went to, the same thing happened. It would just hit the congregation and people would just get suddenly filled with the joy of the Lord and, and uh, get drunk in the Holy Ghost. 
And I remember he would phone me back in South Africa. We would be, uh, it was usually at night after the meetings, which would come out at 12, 31 in the morning. And he'd get back to his home and, or to his apartment. And I mean the hotel room. And he would phone us into at South Africa. And at that time we were just be, being six, seven hours difference. We would just be waking up. And so the phone would ring and wake us up. And you know, when you're first woken up and you haven't had that first cup of black anointing, and, and you're not really quite sure what your name is or, you know, where you are. And here's your brother on the other end laughing uncontrollably in your ear. And telling us all about this amazing outpouring of the joy of the Lord upon people. And laughing so much that, you know, you can hardly hear him. And then he would say, well, go ahead, Gil, just have a double dose. Let it bubble. And I'm going, let it bubble? I don't feel like bubbling. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm still half asleep. And, uh, and I really thought that maybe my brother had been in California too long or in America too long and picked up some kind of squirrely doctrine. And I figured, you know, I'm his older brother. I'm probably going to have to sort him out on a few things. And <laughs> now, you know, the concept was we had seen many times. We pastored a church, co-pastored a church for nine years in Johannesburg, South Africa. And our meetings would start at 3 o'clock in the Sunday afternoon and, and go right through until 11.30 midnight. And there were most Sundays we had a Holy Ghost road kill in the building and people would, there would be one or two that would get joy. But a whole church, it's just too much, you know. You can understand God filling one person with joy. That's, that's okay, you know. God can fill one person with joy. But a whole church, that's too much. It sounds too good to be God. <laughs> And, and that's unfortunately what happens to us traditionally because we've, you know, we've seen, we haven't seen it happen for ourselves. And so we can only let God work in the parameters of what we understand. And I've realized, I've, I have enough sense to realize that it's different strokes for different folks. Seattle Revival Center is kind of, a, a, kind of like a wild place. But that's because it has some wild men at the helm. But if it works for them, that's fine. See, I'm, I'm just going to be a fruit inspector. I, I just look for the fruit. If I see fruit, I'm okay with it. I might not like, particularly like the, the way the, the soil is tilled, but I look for the fruit. Amen. Amen. And so it's different strokes for different folks. But anyway, so yeah, I am still thinking, well, this, maybe this is not God. Maybe it's some kind of weird thing that he's gotten into, you know. And so we had planned to, uh, I'd been over in 1988 with my whole family and we'd really enjoyed America so much and, and went back, just, we just ate and, and slept and, and, and woke up to the thought of being back in America. It just burned in us to come back to America. I wanted to be here so badly. Even when I was a child of eight years old, I, I uh, got saved under Oral, Rob, under, under Oral Roberts ministry at the age of six. And, and I remember through my childhood, I just loved America. We used to, you know, get all the books and magazines I could about America and couldn't imagine kids in America sitting watching television because we only got television in South Africa in 1975. Thank God. But it, it just seemed like a, a bizarre idea that you could sit and watch a box and see, you know, moving pictures in it. And, and, uh, and, and we would see it on the movies and that type of thing. But I had a great desire to come to America. And my three great desires were this. Number one, I wanted to go to Disney World. Number two, I wanted to drive an RV. To me, that was the most incredible thing, that you could drive down the interstates and cross through the mountains in a motorhome you know, and, and it just was too amazing. And then the third thing I wanted to do was become an astronaut. And so two of those desires have been true. I've been to Disney World and we traveled in a motorhome for four and a half years of our, the first phase of our ministry here in America. And I haven't been an astronaut yet, but I will become one day when Jesus, when the trumpet sounds. Hallelujah. 
And so we had been over in 1988, and then in 89 we came out again, my wife and I, and just fell in love with the country even more and met some wonderful, wonderful friends, and it just felt like we were more, really more American than South African. And even then, and this is how strong the calling was to come to America, because when we would hear the Star Spangled Banner, we would get goosebumps and, and have tears streaming down our cheeks and get all a lump in our throat. And we, we're not even born in America, but we just get a, just a lump in, in your throat, you know. You're standing amongst all the Americans, and they're standing there just glibly, you know, just listening to the, to the old anthem again. And we're all choked up and tears, you know, pull out a Kleenex and try to dab the tear away so you didn't look like you were an oddball, you know. <laughs> and so America burned in our spirits. And then in 1990, this is now nine months after this anointing had broken out in my brother's ministry back in, in upstate New York. In 1990, I came over by myself for two months to do meetings in the United States. And uh, Rodney had said to me, Gil, before you start your meetings, come over and see what God is doing in California told me that we've, you know, had revival break out and, 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 it, and over a period of six months he'd been back four times and this is like the, the 16th week of revival in six months, see. And of course they were in between that, they were continuing in the flow of it. And so I went over to, to California, but on the way over, on, on the flight over, I had a, a traveling, total travel time of about 26 hours with layovers in Europe and... Uh, I had a lot of time to sit and think about my life, about my ministry, and about things in general. And uh, because my wife and I had had a stormy marriage for so long, we were living together almost separately, but uh, we'd had uh, 20 years of marital blisters. And uh, I always joke, I say, first come, came the engagement ring, then came the wedding ring, then came the suffering. And if God hadn't stepped in, it might have come to murdering. <laughs> but uh, we really loved each other, but we just had too many things going wrong in our marriage. And it had just begun to, to bring a separation between us. And we really didn't want it to get that way because we both loved God and we loved our kids. And we had the example of good, solid marriages from both of our families. And so we were really hoping that God would, would do something had been for counseling many times and, and uh, you know, if your marriage is bad, you don't really want to hear another encouraging word because you really want God to step in and do a miracle, see. And so I, I engaged in much praying, Lord, change my wife, change my wife, change my wife, change my wife. I did that so much and, and nothing ever happened. And, uh, you know, I really honestly thought that she was the problem, but... Uh, how many know God has to change each individual? And so on the way over, I began thinking about my life and thinking about the condition of my ministry and all the rest of it. And I, 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 said, look, I said this, finally I, I came to grips with it and I remember saying this to the Lord, Lord, either change me or take me home. But I cannot carry on in the condition I'm in. And it was almost like the Lord I could almost hear the Lord saying to me, my son, if I take you home in this condition, you're going to create a mess in heaven. <laughs> because I really figured the going home part was the only answer. I'd prayed for change. I'd prayed for change and my wife still hadn't changed. And so maybe I should just go home and then at least, you know, we had a good insurance policy and that would keep them in finances and I'd be in heaven and all things would be wonderful, see. But how many of you know God has different ideas? The way into the blessing of God is not to pray for death. It's to pray for life. Amen. The way out of your situation is not to die, but to live in Jesus. It's to have a fresh encounter of the Holy Ghost. And so I figured the going home part, but God had something else in mind. And so when I went to, to uh, California, by the time I got there, I was well and truly jet lagged out because of seven hours across the Atlantic and then another three across to the west coast and I tell you what I didn't know what my clock had just 
gone tilt, you know, just, just defunct. And I walked in the middle of this meeting and I got to tell you, it was the, an incredible outpouring of the glory of God. And I witnessed for the first time what my brother had been trying to tell me for all these months Every time he phoned me, how wonderful this was. And I'm still thinking this is a little bit off the wall. But when I got there, I just realized, I immediately recognized it was the same Holy Ghost, the same anointing that we had been experiencing in our meetings, but just much more intensified. So that every person in the building would get hit with the glory of God. And I'm not just talking about just a select few or, you know, a certain age group. I'm talking about from the little children right up to the to the elderly people and every night in order to get out the door you would have to step over bodies strewn right up the passageway out in the parking lot all over people just trying to get in their vehicles and falling out in the parking lot and I thought well this had to be God because I know we've you know we'd laid hands on people till they went bald And occasionally we try to help the Holy Ghost by, you know, just gently, ever increasingly applying pressure. In the name of Jesus, be filled. <laughs> Until the, finally they went down on the floor. But then they would get up five seconds later and go back to their seat and just look the same as what they came the first time. So that was the other aspect that really thrilled me was because yeah, it was not just one or two people getting because we had seen that in our meetings. We'd seen one or two people getting stuck on the floor and some folks having to help out the building, but never a whole church. And when you think about it logically, just forget about what the Word of God says or forget about the fact that God is God and He can do whatever He wants to, but just think about it logically. If we invite God into our midst to do a work, isn't He big enough to hit the whole church? Amen. In the book of Acts, the Bible says the whole place was filled. Another part of the book of Acts says when they prayed, the whole place was shaken. What will happen if the whole place gets shaken here? Well, I suppose in, in, uh, up here in, in Washington, if the whole place got shaken, some people would, f f would wonder this earthquake, what, you know, f number four on the Richter scale. <laughs> Are you all out there or some of you are going home already? And I'm seeing a vision. And so I was witnessing all these people just getting totally touched and saturated with the glory of God. And, and folks would get up every night and just come and testify, oh, I had this and that wrong and I was depressed and God set me free and God's done a work in my marriage. And, and so we saw the visible evidence, the fruit the fruit coming out of the chaos. Because it, you know, it looked like it maybe was a little bit too much out of place and for my conservative heart to take, you know. My conservative mind <laughs> was a little bit too, too much out of place. But it was the fruit that really won me. When I began to see what God was doing and then nightly people were getting saved and born again and filled with the Holy Ghost, it had to be God. And so a couple of nights after I had, you know, had a chance to kind of look at this thing and watch what was happening and decide that maybe my brother wasn't after all into something flaky, but it really was God. And I remember one night as the glory fell, I fell on my face and began to weep for about two hours. Just wept and wept and wept, something I never do. I'm not a crier, and even if I did, I wouldn't let anybody see it. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Men particularly do that. Hello? You know, it's not the macho thing to do. And so we would, rather than show people that we were crying, I'm a man, you know, I don't cry. You know? And so for two hours, I wept and I wept and I wept uncontrollably. And my mind kept saying, you're making a total fool of yourself. But my heart said, shut up, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> and it felt like the hand of God was just moving stuff out of my spirit and just taking junk out of my heart. And when I got up off the floor, I felt clean. I felt incredible inside. 
it almost felt like I just got born again all over again. And so anyway, we had another, another night or two left and I still hadn't received this Holy Ghost joy. I mean, I, I'm going, Lord, this is not fair. And the last night, I mean, I still don't receive it. And it's right at the end of the meeting and I'm still standing there waiting for God to fill me with His joy. And all I do is laugh at other people. But I know I haven't received this thing for myself. And so then, thank God, I hear my brother stand up and he said, well, we got one more extra night and I spoke with the pastor and we're going to continue tomorrow night. So, you know, the revival continues one extra night. And I'm going, yes, this is my night. And so I get in the meeting and it's the deadest meeting you can ever imagine. I mean, it's, it's dead. This thing is dead. Some guy got up and began prophesying at the top of his voice, the biggest load of hogwash you've ever heard. And he falls over on the floor and then begins to prophesy even louder on the floor. And my brother keeps telling him, be quiet. And he keeps, the more he tells him to be quiet, the more he carries on prophesying. So finally, my brother sent one of the ushers down to him and said, so he bent down and whispered in the man's ear loudly. He said, shut up. So finally the guy stopped and now the place is totally dead. I mean, he just prophesied the thing dead. And so my brother, I remember him standing there and this is what I do appreciate about, appreciate about Rodney is that, that he just gives the Holy Ghost opportunity to move and so he just stood like this on the platform, at the platform in the pulpit and he just said, well, we're just going to wait until everybody gets back into what God wants to do here tonight and just stood there the whole time just looking. And I was, by this time, I was really tired. I mean, we just had all these late nights and I was still suffering from jet lag. And so I was sitting up on the platform and I looked at the pastor and he looked at me and we shook our, shook our heads at each other. And so I did something spiritual. I decided to go and lie on the floor and pretend to be interceding. But what I really did was just lay on the floor and, and, and try to, you know, try to, try to sleep a little bit. <laughs> I was sleeping the sleep of the redeemed, of course, you know. <laughs> but it looked good. <laughs> it looked impressive. <laughs> and so after about 20 minutes and, and, and still nothing much was happening, I just began to feel a stirring in my, in my spirit to, to that we needed to worship. And so I got up and I, as I walked towards Rodney to, to go and tell him, just whisper to him and say, listen, I really feel like we need to worship. He looked at me and he said, he said Gil, God's given you a song for the church. And I'm going, he has? And he called the pianist up and he said, come and, come and play for him. And I'm going, thanks a lot, you know. He has a dead service. Now my, my younger brother's going to just, you know, lay it on me. I mean, I, you know, I've got to do something with this dead horse. Or dead donkey, actually. And so I stood up and as she began to play on the piano, as I heard those notes, the song sprung up inside of me and I began to sing a song in the spirits. And as I began to sing, people just began to weep and there came just a cloud of glory that just began to fill the place. And so he had people come up one by one and as they began to come up, they would just fall out in the aisle and fall out on the floor and, and I'm standing up in the front here and as he called a young man that was from South Africa to come out to be prayed for, I began to weep. Trapdoors, this is where they get rid of unwanted preachers. <laughs> you preach too long, they pull a button and you fall through. <laughs> what happened to the preacher? He just raptured. <laughs> and so, as I began to weep for this man, my brother said, Gil, just lay hands on him. And so I stood on the edge with my feet over the top of the, of the uh, stairs, at least the edge of the platform, and it's about this high off the floor. And so as I reached over and laid hands on him, the power of God hit him and he went down. And my brother was standing behind me and there was something over here, I think maybe a, a, a pot plant or something, maybe a speak or something. And this side was the pulpit. And so I'm standing over here and my brother came and stood right behind me and laid hands on my shoulders and began to prophesy over me. Words to the effect that from this day there will come a fresh anointing upon your life and you will minister with the fire of God. And as he's prophesying, I'm starting to feel just a bubbling inside of me, see. 
And I mean, I want to laugh badly, but it's rude to laugh when someone's prophesying. <laughs> You're supposed to stand there and say, yes, Lord, oh, amen. That's right, yes, yes, amen, yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but I can't help it. This bubble is just bursting in inside of me and I, I just can't contain it anymore. And so my whole body's rocking and I'm bent over like this and the next minute I look and I'm going, dear Lord Jesus, there's about three feet down to the floor. God's really going to cream me now. <laughs> and I still don't know to this day how it happened but I ended up lying this way on the platform. Thank God. <laughs> And the joy hit me. I mean, I was the only one laughing in the building, laughing uncontrollably at the top of my voice, making a total fool of myself. People were weeping in the building and I'm laughing. And then slowly but surely I could hear other people start laughing and the joy began to break out all over the building. And yeah, I'm lying on the floor and Rodney's going, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now another family member has got this joy. Now they won't think I'm crazy. Finally, after what I thought was about maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I got up, I sat up with all my eye, you know, my, I looked all, I was really drunk, my tongue was thick, my shirt was hanging out, my jacket was over my shoulders, my tie was all loose, my hair was all over the place, and I looked a mess. And my brother said to me, do you know how long you were on the floor? I said, about 15 minutes. He said, an hour and 45 minutes. I said, no, you can't be serious. And I looked at my watch and lo and behold, I'd been on the floor now in 45 minutes. And I remember while I was lying on the floor laughing uncontrollably, I still said, Lord, how come you wait till this quietest night of the whole week to embarrass me in front of all these people? And he said this to me. He said, because you're too starchy and I'm knocking the starch out of you so that you can go and help others to get in the river. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. And I left that place just so full of the, of the Holy Ghost. And I, I remember the Lord had spoken to me in the word that is spoken over me and said, if you take the final step, the final leap, you will eat the fat of the land. And I knew what God was talking about because I'd, I'd been helping God in my ministry to support my ministry by being an insurance broker. And I'd just been going broke. I really figured I could help God. And so wherever I went to minister, people would come and give me the golden handshake. You know, they'd, they'd take their hand like this and then give it to me. And there was a crumpled up note in my, in my hand. And you're too embarrassed to look at it, you know. And so you, oh, thank you so much, brother. God bless you. And they say, we really enjoyed your ministry. Would you come back again? Oh, sure. And you put this money in your pocket. And you're too scared to look at it. And then when you get home, you take it out and there's 20 bucks, you know. Like wasn't even enough to fill the gas tank in at, at, at $7 a gallon. <laughs> That's what gas costs in Africa. <laughs> and so I'd been trying to help the Holy Ghost and Yahweh was as an insurance broker and, and just really hindering him from doing what he wanted to do through my life. And so I said that night, Lord, I'll go. I don't care what it takes, I'll go. And my head said, but you've got a bad marriage. My head said, your wife will never agree to this, which in the natural was true. Why would she want to go full time on the road with someone that was giving her a load of grief? Hello. And to be honest with you, I didn't really want her to go on the road with me before that because she was giving me a load of grief. <laughs> Amen. But you see, God began to do a work in me, began to change my heart and my attitude. And God had healed me of all the hurts and all the stuff that was accumulated in my spirit and set me free to believe him, to step out upon the word of God for my life, to go and see his will made real in my life and my heart. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so I said to my brother, well, now what do I do now? I've got all my sermons ready to preach this two months of meetings, 55 meetings in total that were booked up and I, and I got all these messages that all came out prior to, you know, 
to the revival and I'd been preaching on the coming revival and you know what's going to happen but in my mind it was always futuristic something is going to happen like 10 years down the road you know the coming revival it's coming we're just pressing in there it's about 10 years down the road you know and, and so he said to me you see you watch when you go to the meeting the power of God will hit the place I said really he said yeah you watch so we flew into Pennsylvania and, and you know forgive me when I say this but my only impression of Pennsylvania was in the middle of winter, raining and, and, and wet snow and, and just dry trees and little hills and, and it just looked like a miserable place, very depressed, you know. Anybody from Pennsylvania, please forgive me. Please forgive me. <laughs> We've actually had wonderful meetings in Pennsylvania. <laughs> forgive me, brother. <laughs> you still love me? <laughs> But, you know, that, I, I, it just looked like a place where God couldn't move, you know. <laughs> and so I got in this meeting, and as I began to preach, the power of God hit the place, and people got drunk in the Holy Ghost. It was totally awesome. And for the first time in my life, I realized that, that, that uh, you know, to have a move of God didn't really need to have me move. It wasn't dependent on how loud I preached or how hard I shouted or how much I jumped up and down or how heavily I laid hands on people's heads. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. <laughs> I found that I didn't have to rock the anointing into them. And so as I stood and watched people, the power of God would just fall into place and people would just fall out in their seats and it was totally awesome. And every, every meeting we, I went to after that, the same thing would happen. Just the power of God would fall in the place. And if you go to the book of Isaiah, everyone say Isaiah. Isaiah. Some of you have of you've learned well. Isaiah 42. I'm going to read to you what happened in my life. Isaiah 43, sorry, verse 18. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. See, because the former things, God's not bound by the former things. God is not bound by what has taken place in your life. Nothing you could ever have gone through will hinder God from moving in your life today. Our problem is when we come to God, we remember all the former things and they stand as obstacles between what God can do and what we think He can do, see. We place limitations on God. Well, you see, you don't understand what my problems are like. I've had people come up in the line and they want to tell me a long sob tale of woe about how bad their life is. And I'm going, well, don't say a word. I don't need to know. I don't actually have the answer, but I can tell you and point you to the one that does have the answer. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so people often want to tell you what's going on in their lives. And I just say, well, if everyone in the building told me everything that's wrong with their lives, I'd walk out more depressed than all of you put together. <laughs> See. Gone are the old days when, you know, people had to come in the line and tell you all, all, and then you had a feel for them, you know, and, and that old compassion and all, oh, Jesus, thou seest how thy servant suffereth. Like God's blind, and I have to remind him. You know what I'm saying? Those were holy prayers, you know. <laughs> Dear God, thou seest what thy servant goeth through. God knows already, see. God knows you by name. Hallelujah. How many excited about that? All three of you. God knows you by name. The Bible says the very hairs on your head are numbered. And some of heads are easier to count than others. But He knows you by name. God knows your problem. God's known about your problem before it even happened. Because He saw what was taking place in your life and knew what it would become. And so it doesn't help to go to God and remind Him where you're at. Just come to Him and let Him work in you anyway. Amen? 
And that's been the difference between this move and what we used to do before. Because we had to try to understand what the person was going through and then with great wisdom tell them how to get out of it. And most people, most times people didn't want to hear how to get out of it. Amen. You go to someone who's depressed and say, well, you know, the Bible says casting all your cares upon him. Go ahead and cast your care. I'll tell you what, they want to cast a slap on your face. You know what I'm saying? Because that doesn't help a depressed person to get another word from God. What they need is the hand of God. What they need is the anointing of the Holy Ghost to come in and destroy the yokes of bondage on the inside. Hallelujah! Glory to God. And so he says, Remember not the former things, neither consider the, old of, the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Everyone say new thing. Now I'll tell you right now, tonight there are many of you that are facing situations you don't know how to come out of them you don't know the answer but i can tell you right now if you'll stay in the flow of the holy ghost if you'll stay in the river of god god will sort them out for you the answer does not lie away from god but in god the answer is not on the edge of the river watching what's happening in others lives the answer lies in the center of the river when you get immersed in the glory of god Hallelujah. See, we're focusing in on the banks of the river and we're seeing the rocks and all the rubble and all the stuff. But when you get underneath the river, you can't see the bank. <laughs> Amen. Who cares what's happening on the bank? Frank. <laughs> I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Now. Everyone say now. now. God's the God of the now. Now it shall spring forth. What does that say to you? Spring forth. Something that will happen suddenly. It will spring forth. Some of you are on the edge of the greatest breakthrough in your life and you don't even realize it. Some of you sitting right at the edge of the biggest, most incredible breakthrough in your life than you could ever imagine. And the only thing stopping you is the limitations you placed on God. Because you're thinking, my problem's too big for God to handle. Most of the times we've been trying to find out how God would do the answer, how God would bring the answer. If He would tell you, you wouldn't believe Him. Amen. If only God would show me. No, God can't show you because if He showed you, you wouldn't believe it. Well, you see, we've had skeptics come to the meetings and say, well, I can't believe this is God. Why would that person be lying on the floor laughing uncontrollably or vibrating so badly? How could that be God? Hello. Well, I tell you what, he's such a big God, if you get in his way, you're going to feel it. Amen. What's so wonderful about this anointing is that it's almost like God just comes in and, and gives us Holy Ghost anesthetic to get us out of the way so that he can do something on the inside of us. It's called the brain bypass operation. The head bypass. <laughs> oh. Head bypass. <laughs> it's like for a couple of for a couple of hours, God gives you an IQ of zero. So that your mind doesn't get in the way, so He can come down and work in your spirit. And when He works in your spirit, there comes an overflow in your flesh. 
Glory to God. My, 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 my. <laughs> now it springs forth. It springs forth. But then he asks the question, shall you not know it? In other words, when I do it, will you even recognize it? Hello. Well, some people say, well, you know, I, I don't really want to go there. I don't want to look like those people. It might ruin my reputation. Well, let me say this. You probably don't have much of a reputation to start off with. <laughs> well, what do my neighbors think of me? They don't think much of you anyway. So you may as well add fuel to their fire. Well, I may lose my dignity. That'll be good. Uh. One guy brought his wife to the meeting. He'd heard that people were, God was setting them free from depression and she'd been into a manic depressive. And the power of God hit her, stuck on the floor. She made a total fool of herself. And this guy was so embarrassed that he, that he told her to, that he took her home. He said, how dare you make such a fool of, of me? But what he forgot was God was setting her free. Amen. Hallelujah. Now it springs forth. Will you even recognize it when it comes? For I will even make a way in the wilderness. Everyone say wilderness. God's not afraid of your wilderness. God's not put off by the intensity of your problem. Does that encourage some of you? God's not put off by the intensity of your problem. It doesn't faze him at all. It's not like he looks at you and says to Jesus, you know, I don't know about that one. That's a little bit hard for us. <laughs> oh, they're too far gone, Jesus. I, I just, you know, let's just pass them by. We don't have enough for them. Like the Presbyterian couple that came to our meeting, our meeting several years ago in Greensboro, North Carolina, had, had just horrendous backgrounds, just, just the most unbelievable stuff that could have ever happened to two people. And they had been married a few years and the marriage was just really bad and both of them were suffering from chronic depression. She had tried to commit suicide a few times and he was suicidal and they'd both under therapy and in medication. And, and, and came into the meeting. The power of God hit them the first night, fell out between the pews, and just, just lay there for two or three hours, totally drunk in the Holy Ghost, laughing absolutely, uh, with such intensity, almost deafening. And every night they came for five weeks, just totally drunk in the Holy Ghost, just came and forgot they were supposed to go for counseling, forgot to take their Prozac, forgot to, to do what the doctor told them to do. After the five-week revival, stayed on in the church and became the song leaders of the church and just God totally healed their marriage and set them free. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. You can read their testimony on the internet. I have a website, revivaltimes.com and you can go on the testimony section and read their testimonies. Just totally awesome what God did for them. 
But if you'd looked in the natural, if they'd have come to me before this wave of revival would have come, I'd have sat in council with them for two hours and listened to this, that both of their side, sides of the story, and I would have looked at them and said, even this one's too hard for God to do. <laughs> I'd have just said, oh, bless your hearts. We'll be thinking of you in prayer. And I'd have been lying because I don't want to forget about them in prayer. We've been in churches where pastors just are totally worn out because they have counseling, uh, di their, their, their di diaries are just full of counseling sessions and they're just totally worn out and we come in for a two, three week revival and then he'll look at me towards the end and say, you know something, my counseling diary is empty. One fellow every Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday morning, he was, when, when we had the morning meetings on, he had to go and attend a class. He was attending a, a, what they call a Christian psychology uh, uh, course in order to help all the people that were hurting in his church. And at the end of three weeks, he came to me and said, you know, I'm wasting my time. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, all the people I've gone to the course for to help have already been touched by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. When we get out of the way with our idea of how God's going to do a thing. Hello. If you don't like what you're seeing in someone else's life, don't knock it because you don't know God. You don't know the mind of God. I might not understand why somebody gyrates around the place and vibrates, but it really has nothing to do with me. It's none of my business. Let God be God. And I'll tell you what, we can do a lot better if we just look for the fruit. Amen? Let's look for the fruit. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The little lady that walked, that was so depressed. Her husband had left her a few years before and just had abused her terribly and she was so depressed and nobody could, all the counsel, every pastor had tried to counsel her, nothing helped. She drove up to the drive through of Wendy's one night and, and the man, the, the guy helping at the counter looked at her and said, my God, lady, it can't be that bad. Because she looked so miserable. Came in the revival meeting and we prayed for her night after night. And every night she came up to be prayed for. I'd say, oh dear Lord, not her again. Because I'd lay hands on her and you could have got more result laying hands on this pulpit. At least you could rock it a little bit, you know. <laughs> and finally one night I left her to pray for more people. And my wife, bless her heart. She has a wonderful compassion in her to help people and she just stayed by this lady and kept on praying for and praying for and praying for and pretty soon the breakthrough came and this lady got filled with the joy of the Lord and I tell you what she's a bubble comes to our, every one of our camp meetings and just beams from ear to ear total change in her her testimony is on the website as well we have a vision to put to have a website so full of testimonies, literally thousands and thousands of testimonies, and fill the whole internet full of testimonies of what God is doing. Glory to God. So when somebody looks up the word depression, up comes a testimony. When they look up for the word Prozac, up comes a testimony. When they look up the word divorce, up comes a testimony. When they look up the word drunk, up comes a testimony. When they look up the word fire, up comes a testimony. When they look up the word flood, up comes a testimony. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's tell the world what Jesus is doing. Let's make it visible to the world what our great God is doing by the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Give God a shout of praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, my, 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 my. Woo. Uh, uh, uh. Florida will never be the same because of it. Amen. 
God's coming to get Lakeland. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Woo. Seattle will definitely never be the same again. <laughs> Without a shadow of a doubt. <laughs> Woo. My, 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 my. I tell you people, I'm so glad for this wave of God. I'm so glad we're out of all that religious garbage. Two hymns and three hers. I love, there, there are some beautiful hymns. And I tell you, anointed hymns are great hymns. But Lord have mercy. I'm so glad we don't even know what a benediction means anymore. <laughs> I'm so glad the biggest problem we have is not getting people to come to church anymore. It's getting people to leave church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Before, I tell you what, you couldn't get them to stay past that anointed or at least unanointed hour. They'd start giving you hints, you know. People would start getting the Pentecostal headache. It looks like they were praying, but actually what they were doing is rubbing the sleep out of their ears and popping a piece of gum in their mouth. But now it looks like people aren't paying attention, but most of the time they're just drunk in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Our problems have changed. Thank God. It's a different life. Hallelujah. Yeah. Woo. Before you had to have three po points in a poem. You had to make sure the poem wasn't read two months ago, you know. Because people kept track of it in their diary. Now all they have in their diary or in the book, their notebook is drink, drunk, double dose, and Daryl. <laughs> I don't think anybody's made any kind of sensible notes here tonight. <laughs> I've had preachers come to me and say, can you give me, can you give me your notes? I say, I'm sorry, I don't have any notes. <laughs> I don't preach from notes. Got delivered from them things some time back already. <laughs> Hallelujah. God doesn't need our education, our educated thoughts. It's not how many times I sit, how many hours I th sit and think about what might be good to say in the meeting. It's not how many wonderful quotations I get from people that, that have died and long, long gone, been buried, that said some kind of a wise statement, because none of that really is going to set anyone free. It's the power and the demonstration of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. That's going to bring the change. My, 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 my. And so I'm excited about the next few years. This is amazing. In August, Darren and, and da <laughs> let, let me try that again. <laughs> uh, 
in August. I tell you, the, the, the <laughs> Woo. Uh, thanks a lot, you're a big help. <laughs> All right. In August. Daryl <laughs> and Debbie are going to be in a Baptist church in, 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 in Atlanta. are going to be in a Baptist church in Augusta, Georgia. It's about an hour and a half apart. Two Baptist churches. The same week. The same week. The same week. The same week. Hallelujah. I tell you what, it's going to be hot between those two areas. <laughs> you know what I'm looking forward to? is when simultaneously every city has a major revival going on simultaneously. Hallelujah! Where there's no place to hide. People think, well, we just go down there to the next city and go to another dead old church there and walk right in the middle of another Holy Ghost revival. Hallelujah! Glory to Jesus! Hallelujah. I tell you what, see, see I tell you what, Seattle can handle several revivals simultaneously. <laughs> Amen. It'll be, which one shall we go to tonight? Glory to God. It's time for the main attraction to be the revival meetings. Not just in Toronto and Brownsville, but all over the world where the airlines book special flights to the revival centers, where hotels have special 800 numbers to book revival, special rates for revival hotel accommodation. Hallelujah. Where taxi cabs know exactly where to go. All you say is, S -s 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 see, and they know where to go. Hallelujah. My, my, my. See, what we've been experiencing over the last few years has been a pocket of revival there and a pocket of revival there and then it's spread around to areas. But I believe God's going to lift the intensity of this thing and wherever we look are going to be revivals on every four corners of the globe. Hallelujah! Glory to Jesus! Hallelujah! Oh, my, 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 my. Because God's doing a new thing. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Rivers. Everyone say rivers. That means there's more than one river. 
That means there's more than one river. I believe there's going to be a Baptist river and a Methodist river and a Presbyterian river and a Pentecostal river and a charismatic river and a crazy-matic river and an automatic river and a vegematic river. You name it, there's going to be rivers for everyone. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. My. So you may as well get ready. You may as well get in, get out, or get run over. Hallelujah. Some people say, yeah, well, we want revival, but really what they want to do is stick their toe in the river. Just dangle my toe in the river. Just a little bit, Lord. We want to just feel the water. Huh. You can't get wet by sticking your shirt... Your You can't get wet by sticking your toe in the shower. I nearly said your show in the tower. <laughs> A little dab is not good enough. A little sip has got not good enough. <laughs> a little drip is not good enough. Lord, just give me a little drip. A little drip is not good enough. God wants a shower, a shower, a shower. Of his glory, a shower, a shower, a shower. Hallelujah. My, 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 my. And when that's once done, get some more. Hallelujah. A shower, a shower. Oh, glory to God. Woo. My, 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 my. Some people just want the container. Some people just want the container. You don't want the container, you want the contents. You don't want the container, you want the contents. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Woo. Mm. I believe it's been raining here. Oh, hallelujah. You know what I'm praying for? It's not just a flood. I'm praying for the church to get drowned. To get drowned. Hallelujah. That'll kill every religious devil you can see, you can find. Glory to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. We need to get the religious stuffing knocked out of us. Hallelujah. And get the glory of God back in the church. Get the fire of the Holy Ghost back in the church. Get the demonstration of the Spirit of God back in the church. Hallelujah. Oh, my. Woo. Hallelujah. Oh, my, 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 my. Shoo. I used to worry about the skeptics, you know. Well, we don't really want to upset too many people, and so we try to make this thing a little, a little bit more comfortable. But I think, I think God's raising, God's doing some things to irritate the religious. <laughs> you find yourself getting a little bit, a bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit irritated. <laughs> That it, that it's time, it's time for the touch of God. Hallelujah. It's time for the water of life. 
He says, I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon dry ground. Floods. God's got a flood for Seattle. God's got a flood for Washington. God's got a flood for the West Coast. God's got a flood. You can't control a flood. You cannot stop a flood. A flood will break down buildings. It will change the way the bank flows. Not the bank flows, but the river flows. <laughs> It'll change the way the bank goes. Hallelujah. If you're a pastor here and you're wanting revival for your church, don't ask God for a trickle because a trickle will not help. Tell him, God, I don't care how many people you wash out my church, but I want the revival flood of the Holy Ghost to come and bring about change. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. It's time for compromise to be set aside and to say, God, we want everything you've got without measure. I don't care how many people don't like it, but Lord, we want revival fires to burn. Hallelujah. Whew. Put away the old fire extinguisher. Put it aside. Let the Holy Ghost fire rage in your church. Of course, if you lose some people, there'll be 10. For every one you lose, there'll be 10 waiting to run in to receive the touch of God. Hallelujah. My. And you'll go home thanking God and saying, Lord, you delivered me from the snare of the fowler and the noisome pestilence. And as a preacher, you'll get free for the first time. Hallelujah. You won't have to worry about brother and sister big bucks getting upset and withdrawing their tithe from your church because God will have a hundred other hungry people out there that will come in and bring the finances. Hallelujah. Oh, bless you, Jesus. We're sitting on the brink of the greatest outpouring the world has ever seen. Somebody once wrote this and said that this revival is literally changing the face of Christianity like it's bad. I'm going, yes, it's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. Hallelujah. Whew. I got good news for you. Revival is coming to a, church, to a church near you. It's coming to a church near you. Just when you thought it was safe to go back to church. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Oh, mighty God. Hallelujah. Now I got rid of all my water. Do you have any more for me, brother? Thank you. <laughs> Woo! I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon dry ground. Don't give a drunk preacher a bottle of water. <laughs> Woo, my, 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 my. Hallelujah. Now let me say this in closing. If you're a pastor and you have a heart for revival, don't wait for revival to come to your church. You go and get revival and bring it back to your church. Hallelujah. You go and get the revival for yourself and bring it back and give the people what they need. Hallelujah. I believe tonight God's going to set many, many people free. 
numbers of you and leadership and even senior pastors and elders and deacons and whatever else there are yet tonight in leadership have wanted to see revival come to your church but you just didn't know how I'll tell you how you get revival don't spend years praying for it there's no point in praying for something that's already come hello there's no point praying for something that's already here I got an email from, from somebody and they emailed me and said, would you please pray? We're praying for revival to come to our church. Would you please pray? We're going into intercession for revival. And I want to say, go and get it and take it right now because it's here. Hallelujah. You don't have to pray for something that's already come. All you have to do is have it. Amen. Don't see revival as the means to bail your church out of financial problems. Hello? Don't see revival as a means to fill the empty pews. You might get a few more empty pews before you see revival come. Hello? You might need to get, a, get rid of some of those old dead heads that have been blocking the way for so many years. Before you see the move of God. Hello? It's called X Lax Ministries. God's removing the blockage. God's changing the constipated church. Hallelujah! Don't be afraid of the fire to come. Don't be afraid of a little bit of wildfire. Wildfire is better than no fire. Amen. And I believe tonight as you dedicate your heart and say, Lord, I want revival to come to my church. I want revival to come to my city. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what you have to do in me, Lord. But I want you to come and do whatever it takes. And you make that commitment to God tonight. Don't come here and tell me, Brother Gill, you don't know what it's like in our city. Oh, there's so much bondage there. There's so many principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Let me tell you why they're there. It's because we did not bring revival to our city. That's why there are principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness there. But when we let the revival fire come in, I tell you the last place the devil wants to be is where revival's at. Amen. Brother Darrell was sharing earlier on how in Indonesia, as they began to just, 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 just get to the church, how those demons just began to come out of people. You know why? Because the anointing of the Holy Ghost was present. If you don't like the devil, then get God. <laughs> if you don't like the devil, get the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Tonight's your night. Tonight's your night. Hallelujah. Tonight's your night. Oh, Jesus. I want everyone to lift hands to heaven right now. Hallelujah. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. <clears throat> oh, bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Give me some more volume in the house. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Oh, let him breathe on me. Let him breathe on me. Let the Spirit 
of God breathe on me let him breathe you need tonight is for the fire of the Holy Ghost to burn 
to begin to burn all the dross, all the things that hinder, to burn out all the hurts, all the pride, all the arrogance, all of the things that you made for yourself, all of the ego, and to burn inside of you a new life, a new hope, a new victory, a new vision, a new purpose. Most of the times burnout comes because we've lost our vision. We've lost the purpose of God. But God wants to bring it back into your life tonight. God wants to burn fresh fire. God wants to pour fresh oil of the Holy Ghost into your heart. Tonight's your night. I want to invite every pastor, every deacon, every elder, every person in leadership tonight. I want to invite you right now to get out of your seats and to get up front here right now. Everyone that is not in revival that needs the fire of God to burn. And if you are in revival and you want to see something greater happen, I want to get you to get out of your seat. Come and get up front here. Tonight, God's glory is going to fill your spirit. There's going to come a breakthrough. God says tonight, there's going to come a breakthrough. It's going to come like a wind of the Spirit that blows in your community, that blows through every corner of your church, that blows through every department, that blows through every one of your leadership and every one of your congregation. Because He wants to bring life to your city. He wants to bring joy to your city. He wants to bring new hope. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Some of you men help stack chairs, please. Thank you. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Lift your hands to heaven, everyone. Just begin by telling Him, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for not allowing you to come and for not allowing the fire of God to burn in my life first. I'm sorry, Lord, for not allowing your spirit to deal with my heart and to bring me to a place where I could be a vessel fit for your use. I'm sorry, Lord, for doubting that you were able to come and bring a new life in my city. I'm sorry, Lord, for backsliding. I'm sorry, Lord, for stepping away from the river of God. And I ask you, Lord, go ahead, pray this out aloud if you have to. Tell him, Lord, I'm sorry. And I give you permission tonight to come into my life afresh. I ask you, Lord, for fresh fire, for fresh oil, for a fresh wind of the Spirit of God to blow in my life tonight. And I dedicate myself to revival. Now, this is very important. God told me to tell you to say this tonight. Lord, I'm not afraid of man. I'm not afraid of what man will say. I want the move of God above what men will say. I don't care if you have to come and change every aspect of my church. But Lord, I want revival. Nothing else. Nothing less. I want revival for my church. I want to see the fire of God burn. To touch the lives of men and women. To touch the lives of unsaved people in my city. To see revival come in every suburb, every part of my city. 
In Jesus' name. Bring it, Lord. Bring it, Lord. Bring it, Lord. Let it come speedily like a rushing mighty wind. Let it blow, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Now give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Lord, bless you, Lord. Oh, bless you, Lord. Oh, bless you, Lord. Oh, bless you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. I want you to do something else tonight. Revival is not a man-made thing. Revival is not a pulpit thing. It's not something that belongs to one ministry. That's one thing I do appreciate about Pastor Darrell's heart. Is he wants to link up with others and help them. But revival is not about something that is something that you protect. Revival is something you give out. Revival is not just about, I'll tell you where people have made the mistake in the past. They wanted revival just for their church just so it could be said well that's our church and we're the ones that God's blessing and we want to see many many people and have a big building but I tell you what that's not the heart of God God's idea of revival is where revival hits every church every denomination in your city when revival comes to the Catholics to the Baptists to the Episcopalians to the Methodists hallelujah to the Charismatics to the Assembly of God's to the church of God is for every place. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to do something tonight. We're going to link join hands right across this audience tonight. Every one of you in leadership, you re represent another church. We're going to ask God for such a spirit of unity to come. For a, such a spirit of unity to come in the church where the jealousy will be broken, where the spirit of competition will be broken, where people will not be concerned. Hallelujah. But where people will close down the church doors in order to go and join their neighbors in revival. Hallelujah. So the world can see that there is unity in the church. Where we're not worried about who gets the offering, but how many people get saved. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Lord, as we join hands tonight, I sense such a mighty, whole, mighty, holy anointing in this place tonight. Lord, I believe in the realm of the Spirit. You are setting up connections. There is a joining in the Spirit tonight. Right across, across the United States of America that Lord there will come such a unity for revival that Lord right now even the devil trembles as he becomes aware of what is taking place in the spirit tonight and I pray for a mighty outpouring of your glory in Jesus name a mighty outpouring of your glory Lord hallelujah Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, bless you, Jesus. A great outpouring, Lord. A great outpouring, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Oh, we press in, Lord. We press in, Jesus. We press in, Lord. 
We press into revival tonight. We press into revival tonight. Oh, hallelujah. We press into revival tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Bring it to the Methodists. Bring it to the Episcopalians. Oh, bring it to the Baptist Lord. Bring it to the Pentecostals. To every denomination, Lord. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Lord, let the next six months astound us, Lord. Let the next six months blow us away. In Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, bless the Lord. We press in, Jesus. Oh, we press in, Lord. Like the woman with the issue of blood, we press in, we press in, we press in, like the blind man waiting patiently, we press in through the crowd, through the crowd, and suddenly. A touch from heaven. Jesus came and he set me free. And suddenly, a touch from heaven. Jesus came and he set me free. He set me free. He set me free. He set me free. He set you free. He set your city free. He set your church free. Oh, he set them free. Oh, free to serve the Lord. Oh, free. Set them free, just like the woman with the issue of blood. We press in, we press in, like the blind man waiting patiently. We press in, come on, press in tonight. Through the crowd, and suddenly a touch from heaven is gonna come suddenly. Jesus came and he set me free, and suddenly a touch from heaven. Jesus came and he set me free. 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 Tell him right now, Lord, you set me free. You set me free. You set me free. You set my church free. You set my church free, Lord. You set me free. The oh, free. There is no way 
He will make a way for you. Oh, He will make a way for you. He will make a river in the desert to give drink to His people. He will make a way for you, for you. for that way thank him for the change thank him for the change oh thank him for the change oh bless you Lord oh bless you Jesus Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Oh, bless you, Jesus. I tell you, people, revival's going to come quicker than you realize. Revival's going to come quicker to your church than you realize. Suddenly. Everyone say suddenly. Oh, hallelujah. Turn to the person next to you and look at them in the face and say, Suddenly. It's coming. Hallelujah. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Now find a neck and hug on it for a few moments. Find a neck and hug on it for a few moments. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Turn the monitor down a little bit for me. I need more volume in the house, please. A little bit more, less volume in the monitor. Hallelujah. Whew. Oh, my, 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 my. Now we're going to lay hands on everyone in a few moments. If you still want hands laid on you, so. But just right now, I feel we need to celebrate. Hallelujah. Up some volume yeah. in the house, please. Volume in the house. Up. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, glory. Celebrate now. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. 
celebrate, Jesus celebrate, celebrate, Jesus celebrate. He's risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Jesus, oh, bless you, Lord, bless you, Lord, bless you, Lord, hallelujah, oh, glory to Jesus, glory to Jesus, oh, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God, we worship you, Lord, oh, hallelujah, I tell you, this place is cranked tonight, <laughs> Ooh, glory to God, this place is cranked tonight, Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo, my. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Rejoice for the 
the steps of a righteous man. They are ordered of God. They are ordered of God. Rejoice.
Lord, I want to see the hand of God move mightily inside of me. I'm hungry for a move of God. Tell him, Lord, I'm hungry. Lord, I'm hungry for a mighty move of God. Lord, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty, Lord. Pour out your Holy Ghost. Lord, I want to see the hand of God move mightily inside of me. I'm hungry for a move of God. A move of God, Lord. Oh, I'm hungry, Lord, for a move of God. Lord, I want to see the hand of God move mightily inside of me i'm hungry i'm hungry lord i'm hungry lord for a move of god just turn this thing oh bless you a move of God. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, bless you, Lord. What we're going to do right now is I want everyone just to get your toe on the line. Just so that there's room for people when they fall. I'm going to have the ministry team come and just come and lay hands on every one of you. I tell you, there's been such a powerful impartation tonight right before the service and during the meeting and I believe God has done some wonderful things but I know many of you are still hungry for more and so I want the ministry team just to get on out there and I'm going to come down my wife and I and we're going to lay hands on you in a, in a little while and oh bless you Jesus oh bless you Lord True. Oh, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Oh, mighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lift your hands to heaven. Lord, let your glory fall in this place tonight. Let your, let your glory fall in this place tonight, Jesus. Let the fire of God burn in every heart tonight. As never before, Lord, in Jesus' name. Oh, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Almighty God. Now just go ahead and receive. I tell you what, God's going to fill many of you with peace tonight. Some of you came in turmoil tonight. And God's going to fill you with peace. Some of you are going to experience a new baptism of love new compassion for souls some of you are going to experience a new fire of God burning yeah. inside of you yeah. a new fire of God go ahead and just receive it as hands are laid on you just go ahead and receive it tonight in the name of Jesus just go ahead and receive it oh hallelujah hallelujah thank you Jesus Lord let your glory fill every vessel here tonight let the fire of God burn in every heart and every life in Jesus' name. Oh, precious Lord, let your glory fill, Jesus. Let your glory fill, Jesus. Oh, 
Take it right down. Take it in Jesus' name. The fire and the glory of God fills this vessel tonight. In Jesus' name. Take it right. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Take it right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Give him a baptism of fire tonight, Lord. A baptism of fire tonight. A baptism of fire tonight. Oh, let the fire of God burn in Jesus' name. Take it right now. 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 Turn those keyboards up, please. Turn the keyboards up a bit. Go ahead. Fire of the Holy Ghost. Fire of the Holy Ghost. Fire, 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 fire. Fire, Lord. Fire, Lord. Fire, Lord. Let your glory fall in this place. Oh, let your glory fall. Let your glory fall, Lord. Let your glory fall. Let your glory fall. 